On this special edition of What the Ship, container shipping companies reach record profits again. The first grain ship set sail from the port of Odessa since February. The last coal ship departs from Hawaii ever. Pasha Group receives a brand new container ship and it's fueled by nothing but LNG. And then finally, RIMPAC 2022, the biggest naval exercise in the world, just completed in the Pacific, but it was fueled by commercial tankers. Welcome to this episode of What the Ship. As you can tell, we're not in our normal location, on the road, on vacation with the family, but still putting together the weekly news show that is What the Ship, the finest maritime news on YouTube. All right. Before we jump into our five stories for this week, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they go on. All right, let's go ahead and hit into our first story. So a lot of stories about whether or not container shipping is going down, what's going on with freight rates declining, are they going to stay declining, are they going to come back up again? But the one constant ha that has been in the container shipping market has been record profits for the big container ship companies. This story right here on G Captain talks about this. Maris just upgraded their guidance as congestion lingers longer than anticipated. You'll see right here that this story by Mike Schuller talks about it. Maris said Tuesday and now expects earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amateurization, the EBITDA, I know there's an acronym how to say that, I'm, I'm not an economist, of $37 billion in 2022, a 23% increase from the $30 billion forecast it had called previously up $7 billion. And let's be clear, we're seeing this across the board with all the main, major container companies. Everybody is peaking up. Hophog Lloyd, CMA, CGM, Matson, Zim, you name it. We've seen it across the boards in all these companies. They are making record profits right now. Why? Because freight is still at an all-time high. Everybody keeps talking about it. I saw this today on Twitter. Somebody posted something about the fact that, well, you know, container rates are down 32% year to year from where it was a year ago today to where it is today. Again, 32% down from the highest it's ever been. It's still way above what it's costing. And plus, by the way, shippers don't care about just the ocean freight rates. They have to get the goods from the place where they're being packaged to where they need to be sold. And if you can't get it there for a normal price, that's a problem. And right now, adding in ocean transportation, road, rail, warehousing, and final distribution for that last mile is kicking in huge amount of money. It is still expensive to move goods. And then you have this story over here again, which is another great one that adds on to this. And one of the things I always love to do is piece together these stories in this. Sam Chambers with two stories. This one, Trans-Pacific Leadership Shakeup. And in particular, he's looking at data that's being put out here regarding the ocean freight rates. In particular, here's this great chart that's looking at those freight rates. Again, we were at record highs, we're down, but we're still at highs that you have never really seen before. Go back years to get to this point where you're seeing these rates. But most importantly, one of the things that he's highlighting is these ocean shipping companies that are doing extremely well. When you look at their eastbound trans-Pacific liftings by carrier and the volume growth, look at where that volume growth is. Who's growing, who's not? You know, when you look at this list, I apologize, I have to put on my glasses to be able to say, ONE is declining, Maersk is up 66%, CMA, CGM up 34, Costco 31, but MSC up 160%. That's one of the big ones that you're seeing, this huge shift that's taking place. And then you add to it this third story. We're talking about the shift in the change in the Trans-Pacific, who's becoming the dominant carrier. This story by Sam, port congestion spurs, liner share rally, large caps proliferate. When you look at, again, the market capitalization for these companies, and you look at the big ones, those that have large caps over $10 billion is growing. Hophog with a market cap of $61.2 billion, Maersk 49.8, 
Costco, 30.4. Evergreen, Yang Min and One High, all over 10 million. And then even in your mid caps, HMM, uh, SITC, Zim, and Matson in there. It's really amazing to see this amount of money that's coming into these shipping firms. Question is going to be, what do they do with that money? How do they invest it? How do they spend it? How do they put it back into shipping? New technologies? Are they buying terminals? Are they improving their logistics systems? E-commerce, aviation? No telling what they're doing with it. But a really interesting development, again, we're seeing in containerization. While everybody's screaming potential freight recession, uh, possible economic recession, on the ocean carrier side right now, ships are flowing with full cargoes coming across. And yeah, they're, they're slowing up because of the jam in the ports right now, but we're still seeing record profits on the ocean carriers. All right, let's jump over to story number two. Story number two takes us to the Black Sea and the departure of the motor vessel Razzoni, a Sierra Leone flagged bulker from the port of Odessa carrying nearly 25,000 tons of corn, specifically Ukrainian corn from a Ukrainian port. We haven't seen a large vessel leave a Ukrainian port, at least not in the Gulf of Odessa, since February. This is all part of the negotiation that was brokered via Turkey between Russia and Ukraine with the UN providing oversight. Uh, a lot of eyes are on the movement of this vessel. This vessel is heading into Istanbul currently. It has to be inspected by a joint group, Russia and Ukraine, to ensure it's just hauling out grain. And that will open the potential for more ships. These are the ships that have been stuck in Ukraine coming out. Obviously, a lot of issues associated with this. Russia wants this grain flowing because they want their grain to flow and they don't want to be stopped and have harassments. This is a big issue because there was just a recent shipment of Russian grain, which is supposedly not Russian grain, but Ukrainian grain, getting stopped. What the Russians are hoping is this will open it up and we'll see the flowing of Russian grain, Russian fertilizer alongside Ukrainian grain. Now, the Ukrainians escorted this vessel out. They piloted it out. Obviously, got it through the mines that were out there, got the vessel out. Lloyd's has been working with the United Nations to provide insurance for these vessels to cover the war risk portion of it. Not a lot of information coming out about this right now. Lloyd's List just had a story about this, that there are 10 other ships waiting to come out. They're waiting for this to clear up obviously a big movement again did a couple of videos on this talking about the importance of ukrainian and russian grain out there and it's not just russian ukrainian food it's fuel it's fuel fertilizer a lot of issues at play here the question becomes what happens should one of these vessels sailing out of ukraine or sailing to ukraine which is another issue because we know that there is a ship heading right now to istanbul that's going to clear through the joint center to sail to the Ukrainian ports. That's something we haven't seen yet. Somebody sail from Istanbul up to, through the Turkish Straits, to a Ukrainian port. Question is, what happens if one of these ships gets hit? Right now, we're seeing ships sailing from open registries, Sierra Leone, this new ship coming in is a Liberian flagged vessel. So again, we're not seeing anyone. We're not seeing escorts of these vessels. These ships are sailing basically on their own out of the area. We're not seeing escorts put in except for coming out of the Ukrainian ports. And then they're basically sailing on their own. Is this going to be the wild, wild west? Does this turn into the piracy of the East Africa coast? Does it turn into the tanker war of the 1980s? I mean, we're just not sure what happens here next, but it's something that's going to be watched very closely here. And if one of these ships gets hit, it's going to raise a new issue. Now, none of the ships may be hit at all. And what we may see is a resumption of normal trade, which would be great because you need to get this food down to Africa. The problem is this is going to start bolstering the Ukrainian economy, something Russia doesn't really want to see. All right, let's jump over to story number three. Story number three takes us to the beautiful islands of Hawaii. A story by John Conrad over G-Captain. What happens when the last coal ship 
leaves Hawaii. The motor vessel Flying Tigers, great name, by the way, uh, departed from Barber's Point the other day after dropping off 15,000 tons of Indonesian coal. And this is the last coal that's going to be delivered to Hawaii as a fuel source. Uh, we see this note here from the governor of Hawaii putting it out here that in its time, coal was an important resource for Hawaii. And I'd like to thank the workers who have run our last remaining coal plant. Now, energy in Hawaii is a big one. Obviously, there's renewables, there's wind, there's solar, but the large bulk of this is being provided by fossil fuel. 15% have been provided by coal, the rest by basically oil and gasoline. And there's a lot of issues associated that's looming on the horizon. One of the big issues here is as you start shifting over to oil and more oil to be used right now, is there's a shortage of oil tankers or sufficient oil tankers to carry this because Hawaii being a US state, it falls under the Jones Act, specifically section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 that says that all cargo delivered from a U.S. port to another U.S. port or offloaded, loaded and offloaded, has to be on a U.S. flag vessel, U.S. built vessel, U.S. crewed vessel, and a U.S. owned vessel. And so all those provisions require Jones Act tankers. And recently, a Jones Act tanker was phased out to Houston, which was formerly a uh, military seal of command vessel. But we've seen new tankers come into the service and are providing it now. But you add to this the issue with the Red Hill fueling facility. This is the large fueling base the U.S. Navy uses. It's being shut down. And it's being shut down because of fuel leakage into the aquifer. And that means that the largest fuel depository for the U.S. military in the Central Pacific is going away. And the way that the Department of Defense hopes to overcome that is by chartering and putting tankers into Hawaii and in the Pacific area, kind of pre-positioned and loading them. But you're going to need more oil coming into Hawaii now. And that's going to place some competition out there for this. Now, there is a program to offset this called the Tanker Security Program. And the U.S. Tanker Security Program is a program whereby $60 million a year is allocated to fund or, or offset the costs to operate U.S. flag vessels, specifically 10 tankers. So about $6 million across 10 vessels, $60 million. And the goal here is to keep ensure that the U.S. tankers in here. The problem is that we're just not enough U.S. tankers. Uh, the tanker market is spotty. You run to wherever the fuel is. You can buy it cheap and sell it high. That's basically what you do with tankers. Within the Jones Act trade, it's closed trade. It's closed because nobody can get into that trade. So U.S. tankers operate between the West Coast and Hawaii. They take crude oil down from Alaska, bring it to California to the refineries. They bring oil and gasoline out of Texas and ship it over to places that aren't connected to pipeline, Florida, New England, for example. It's a finite amount of capacity you need. And every time this makes the news is because something happens. A hurricane disrupts the pipeline, shuts down refineries, and all of a sudden you hear screaming for Jones Act waivers. This is a big issue. Because Hawaii has shut down their last coal plant and now shifting over to oil, this is raising the issue about oil shipments to Hawaii. And let me be clear, you're going to hear a lot about this. You're going to hear a lot of people want to say, let's just use foreign tankers. Foreign tankers with foreign crews, they're cheaper, they're more affordable. It'll help lower the price of gasoline in Hawaii. But just remember, the price of gasoline is lower in Hawaii than it is in California right now. There's a lot of issues that associate with the cost of any product. And if you're in Hawaii, you're in the middle of the Pacific. I mean, you're 5,000 miles or 3,000 miles from anywhere. So no matter what you could do, fuel is going to be and prices are going to be expensive. But we need to be looking at this issue because Hawaii is such a major military post too. You Do you really want your oil and fuel dependency to be in the hands of ships and tankers that you have very little control over? That's an issue. What happens if you need to take those tankers and use them to supplement your military tankers? A story we're going to talk about here in a minute. All that has to be factored in. It's great to be shifting over to clean, renewable energy. However, we're still really dependent on things like oil because you get so much power 
from the product and it's readily available. It's easy to transport. There's a lot of utility to it. I understand the environmental issues associated with it, but also understand the impact that this is having. The decision to close that coal plan in Oahu at Barbers Point now means that Hawaii is more dependent on oil and it raises the level of issues concerning why we need a true maritime policy. And we're gonna come back and talk about the tanker security program here when we hit our last story. All right, let's jump over to story number four. All right, story number four, and I should make a note here that this is gonna be out of sync with some of my other videos. So I'm dropping this video August 3rd. The following day, August 4th, I'm dropping a video about the launch and, and delivery of the newest vessel on the Great Lakes. And I talk about the fact how there's been no vessels added to the Merchant Marine in a long time. There's a big joke I do at the beginning of that video and you'll see it on Thursday. However, I filmed that video like two weeks ago before I went on vacation, so I had it. Didn't realize that this vessel was going to deliver when it did. So it, it, we're at a little bit out of sync, I apologize. But anyway, this is the second vessel to be delivered since the beginning of this program. And I don't have my uh, my uh, wine glass to congratulate ourselves and, and think about it. But the motor vessel George III is going to be delivered or has been delivered to Pasha Group. And Pasha is the second major shipping line that services Hawaii. We've got a Hawaii theme here tonight. Uh, Pasha, along with Matson, provides service to it. And what's unique about the George III, and it's not the only vessel like this, is it's completely LNG fueled, liquefied natural gas. Doesn't use diesel fuel, it uses liquefied natural gas. This large section here on the stern is the storage tanks for the LNG, the liquefied natural gas. It's one of the drawbacks of this design. It's great environmentally because it has almost no emissions at all because you're burning clean liquefied natural gas. The problem is twofold. Number one is storage. You need these huge storage tanks on these vessels. This is also, can I be clear about a, a re, something very important here? This is why these vessels are unique to Hawaii for a couple of things. Hawaii with only a million residents on board and then some of those residents spread out on islands around doesn't have a huge cargo, cargo volume coming in. And so you have to use these smaller vessels. And the Georgia third is a smaller vessel. If you come down here into the story, they talk about it. Here it is. She was built by uh, Keppel M. M. Fells in Brownsville, Texas. Another thing, Keppel has never built a ship before. They were building basically drill platforms. They've delivered the ship 2,525 TEU capacity. Uh, she's one of two vessels in the Ohana class ship. Ohana means family. If you've never seen Stitch, you, that's where that comes from. Uh, She's joining in, and one of the most important things about this is she's joining some other LNG ships in this trade. Very clean trade. You know, when we start talking about, and we've had these stories about Shanghai to LA, there was just a recent story about Shanghai to Rotterdam wanting to use green vessels, really no emissions whatsoever. That is tough to do in the size of the vessels they want to use and the, uh, the distances. But from Hawaii to the West Coast, it is much more manageable, especially on a ship the size of 2,525 TEU. And so the Georgia Third is a really interesting vessel to be used. And again, she joins some other vessels that are out there, some from Crowley, some from Tote, that are already using this LNG propulsion. But understand, you give up something. You lose a lot of cargo space on this. And also bunkering becomes a bit, bit of an issue. You need to refuel at very special facilities. You need to make sure that you have that ability to transfer liquefied natural gas from storage tanks to the vessels and use it. And you're going to hear a lot of things about this vessel. Number one, you'll hear groups like Cato. Hello, Cato. Hello, everybody at Cato. Good to see you again. Uh, they're going to sit there and say, well, number one, the ship is like two years late. Well, yeah, because it's being built by a ship firm that's never built a container ship before, but they built it and they delivered it and it's operational and they're building another one to go along with it. Second, you'll hear, oh, this ship is so expensive because it's, you know, they'll, they'll compare this ship to one that's built in Korea or China or Japan. Well, okay, show me the true cost of the vessels being built in China, Japan, and Korea, including the subsidies that are being paid by those, comp those countries, the offsets Japan does because they own part of the vessels they build for shipping lines. Show me that. 
Uh, the other problem is we're only building one or two ships here at a time. And when you build one or two ships, it's a work of art. It's not a ship. You're not pumping them out like F-150s off an assembly line. They get really expensive because you get to build everything from scratch for the vessels. We need to be building more vessels. We need to build 10 of those vessels. We need to be putting them in the coastal trade. We need to be doing that. And we need to have a government policy that promotes investment in American shipping. That simple. Where's the shark tank for global shipping? Where's the shark? They're, they're, they're out there. Go to Rotterdam, go to Shanghai, go to, go to Tokyo. You can find innovation labs for maritime shipping, but you can't find them in the United States. And that is the criminal nature of this. Yeah, they're going to scream that, you know, you can buy a, a container ship 10 times the size of this for half the cost. Well, number one, the most important, expensive part of a ship is the hull and the engine. Once you stretch it out and getting bigger, yeah, you get more cost in there, but you're still paying for the bulk there. But the other issue here is foreign ships are not going to come into Hawaii and service it in a dedicated trade the way the Americans do. They're just not. I mean, look at the fact that the big container companies are boy, you know, basically bypassing Oakland. Uh, why? Because it slows them down. It's not affordable. Well, Hawaii's out of the way. You may think Hawaii is halfway across the Pacific. It's not in on the route that these ships take. They go up through the Aleutians. And so to think that ocean carriers are gonna come in and service Hawaii on a regular basis is, is number one, is not proven by anybody, let alone the fact that the one company that would come in in a minute to do this would be Costco, the Chinese overseas shipping company, because they would love to get it. And don't forget, Matson provides and Pasha provide a key strategic support to the U.S. military. Hawaii is a series of military bases. They're strewn along the islands throughout the Pacific. They're the hub for this. And if you allow the transportation of military goods on it, you would need dedicated ships then just to haul military gear instead of spreading it across on mats and Pasha. It, it, it's a problem that needs to be understand. But the introduction of the Georgia Third right behind the Barker up on the Great Lakes is a great sign. We're seeing ships entered into the Merchant Marine. Problem is we need more. We need to do it in a larger measure and we need support so that commercially there is profitability in investing in American shipping. We're seeing profitability in shipping right now. Go to story number one and go take a look at it. But we're not seeing it in America. We're seeing it now with profits by Matson and some other companies, OSG, for example, Overseas Shipping Group. But we need to see that really cemented. This is why we need a maritime policy that's not just the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, but also the March Marine. Let's go to story number five. Story number five is always the story I like to talk about. Pull it out of the news. And this is one that is, again, in Hawaii. There seems to be a theme here. I'm not sure why. Every week, the Military Sea Lift Command highlights several of their ships, one or two or some more sometimes, each week. And this week's ship in the spotlight are two vessels, the motor tanker Maersk Perry and the SLNC Goodwill. SLNC is Schuyler Lines Navigation Company. These are two commercial tankers that are chartered by the Navy's Military Sea Lift Command. I got a video dropping on Friday that's going to talk about the Navy's Military Sea Lift Command. This is the entity that crews one-fifth out of the Navy's vessels with merchant mariners. These two ships are chartered vessels that are added to that. And these are commercial tankers. And the Navy highlighted these two ships, or MSC, I should say, highlighted these two ships because the role they just played in an exercise known as RIMPAC 2022. Now, if you don't know about RIMPAC, you may actually, you've ever seen the movie Battleship, uh, that exercise that took place before the aliens landed and the John Paul Jones had to save the day along with the Battleship Missouri. Uh, that was RIMPAC. But RIMPAC 2022 is a huge operation. It is the biggest naval exercise in the world. 37 Allied ships took place. This is the very famous photo op they always do at the end of the exercise. I did a video a few weeks ago about a Peruvian vessel that suffered a engine room fire, the Geese, two crew members severely uh, wounded in that, but uh, the ship had to be towed back into Pearl Harbor. It was taking part in RIMPAC. And this story over here on the drive 
gives you all the details about the, the operation, the scope and scale of it. It's just a tremendous operation. Vessels from all around the world are participating in it. But obviously, when these ships set sail, we even have some unmanned vessels taking part in this. But when these ships set sail, they have to be replenished at sea, underway replenishment. And the Navy tends to do that with vessels specifically geared to that. However, the replenishment vessels, the ones that come alongside the Navy vessels and fly across rigs that provide fuel and ammunition and, and food and toilet paper and everything else they need, those vessels need to be resupplied. And since the end of the Vietnam War, the trend has been that those vessels have been operated by the Navy's military seal of command, largely civilians. Uh, it was accelerated in the 1990s until about 2010 when all auxiliaries are manned by uh, civilians. And again, story dropping on Friday, it's going to talk more about this than, than, and then talk about the issues with it. But the issue here is that those replenishment vessels, the oilers, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, supply and store ships and ammunition ships need to be resupplied. And that's where the Maersk Perry and the SNLC Goodwill came in. This is a story from MSC they put on their webpage. And they talk about this. Tanker ships deliver fuel to MSC ships via console. Console is a consolidation operation in support of RIMPAC. Underway in the waters off the coast of Hawaii, MSC chartered tanker ships, MemT, Maersk Perry, and SLNC Goodwill are providing at-sea deliveries to the MSC combat logistics force ships that are supporting underway phase of the biannual maritime exercise. Goes down in here. Uh, Maersk Perry is delivering JP-5, that's jet fuel, aviation fuel and diesel fuel, and Goodwill is delivering diesel fuel to the USNS Henry J. Kaiser and the Pecos. These are two MSC oilers, the dry cargo ammunition ship Washington Chambers, through a series of consolidation cargo operations. This is the problem I have with this story right here. And you knew I was going to have a problem with this or else I wouldn't have uh, mentioned it. I would always you know, kind of laud the fact that you have these commercial ships that are providing the fuel here. But MSC has to go a step further and say this. MSC reintroduced conducting tanker to oiler consoles at sea in 2015 as a way to uh, uh, utilize a flexible platform that allows MSC to operate worldwide at a variety of, of missions. All right, I, I, I got to take a minute here and say something. First off, this was the way that operations were done since World War II. Commercial vessels, tankers, cargo ships would come out, meet Navy underway replenishment vessels, fill them up, and then the underway replenishment vessels refueled, replenished the Navy combatants. This was known as station and, excuse me, station and shuttle ships. The station ships were the ones that were with the, the task group. They were the ones that were stationed with the forward battle group, and they would run back to the shuttle ships, the ships coming out of port, commercial ships coming out of port, replenish and then head back to the fleet. And these commercial ships would do all the running. They'd run to port, get all the fuel. They were typically bigger, larger, so they can provide more to several replenishment vessels at a time. Well, that report said MSC reintroduced this in 2015. That's because we stopped doing that. Because in the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War and Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the Navy realized, well, let's just get rid of these, these shuttle ships and we'll just do, use the station ships and we'll let the station ships run back and forth. And that worked fine, by the way, when you're fighting, for example, in Korea and you're running to Japan or if you're fighting in Vietnam and you're running to the Philippines or if you're riding, fighting in the Persian Gulf and you run to Bahrain or Oman, that's great. You're a couple hundred miles. That's fantastic. If you're fighting China, and you got to run across the Pacific, especially with the closure of Red Hill, the facility in Pearl Harbor, you're talking about running 5,000 miles. That's going to take your ships out of action. And when we talked earlier about Hawaii needing more tankers, this is the perfect reason right here. You need tankers not just to provide oil to Hawaii, but you need it for this defense mission. So we should be building new tankers. We're not building new tankers. We haven't built any new tankers in almost 10 years now. And that's a big problem. We need to be building new tankers. Plus they have a defense mission. The 
program that's been created, the tanker security program, provides $6 million for each ship. The problem is tankers don't work the same way as ships in the maritime security program, container ships, roll on, roll off vessels. The tanker market is it's peaks and troughs, man. It just goes up and down, up and down. It's crazy. And at times you got to lay up your tankers. You're never going to use them. Well, that takes a tanker out of service for weeks at a time. You need a program that keeps those ships in a, at least a reduced operating status or operating with the military so that they have a job to do. We need to be talking with commercial firms, with the military. We need to right-size our military. We're running our underway replenishment vessels like the Pecos, like the Washington Chambers, like the Henry J. Kaiser that supported this operation, ragged. When you see images of those ships, they look terrible. That's because they're running and basically performing two jobs, that of the shuttle ship and the station ship, when in truth, they should be supplemented by commercial vessels. And understand, when you start building merchant ships, commercial vessels in the United States, number one, that lowers the cost of building new ships, not just for the commercial side, but the military side, increases our shipyards, increases the number of merchant mariners working, increases our sea lift capability. It all around the board increases everything. And yes, is there upfront cost? Yes, there is upfront cost. There's no doubt about it. Should it be borne by the Department of Defense? No, it should, this is a government issue. It should be borne by everybody. But at the same time, we need to make laws and regulations that allow for private investment because that's how you solve these problems. Other countries have solved these problems, but you need to be able to help and, and, and kind of direct funding to these problems. Five very important issues that we talked about today. And I hope you enjoyed today's video. As you can tell, I'm not in my normal spot. I'm on the road. I think you may have gotten a hint of where I am on the road based on today's videos, but I will not disclose. You can postulate in the, in, in the comment section where in the world you think Sal is this week. I'll be back next week at my usual locale in beautiful North Carolina. Got some more videos popping up here that were pre-recorded and some interviews I've done to keep uh, videos coming up to you. So be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. And if you can, if you can, contribute to the page. Thanks for tuning in this week. And until next week, the Sal saying aloha.